Stargate Voyager. Welcome to the Stargate Voyager podcast. I've got some very special guests with me on this episode to help me recap our amazing, incredible Peru and Bolivia tour that happened just literally like two weeks ago. And I'm going to introduce these guys to you in just a moment. And we're going to discuss the many mysteries, that uh, mysterious sites we visited. We'll get into some of the uh, very interesting ancient legends of the Andean region. And uh, I'm sure there's going to be a lot of laughs along the way. Uh, but before we dive into this episode, I just want to remind everybody, please subscribe to this podcast from wherever you are watching or listening, whether that's Spotify, YouTube, Apple Podcasts, and even better, give us a five-star review because I'm sure you're going to love this episode and uh, that helps the uh, podcast to break through the algorithms and help other people find it the higher it's rated. So hit that five star. That would be greatly appreciated. Also, something else to note, if you are on um, Instagram, YouTube, or Facebook, um, I'm now offering exclusive content for subscribers. And so for, I believe it's $4.99 a month, you can um, subscribe and get loads of video content from Peru, from Egypt, from Bolivia, uh, behind the scenes, 4K, HD, high quality video content up close without having to travel the world and suffer like we did. So um, guys, welcome. I've got John with me. I've got Max and Steven, three of the coolest dudes on the planet. Um, I met John a couple years ago in Egypt on uh, the Stargate Voyager, Voyager Egypt tour. And this guy was just awesome this cool surfing dude from Hawaii. So it was so awesome to have John back uh, with me in Peru and Bolivia. And then we got to meet Max, this uh, French guy who lives in Germany. And uh, <laughs> Max, you're a, you're a Mad Uno player. And then we have Steven, the handyman from uh, Oklahoma. So you guys, it was a blast being with you. And why don't each of you, we'll start with um, John. Just kind of tell us um, why you wanted to go on this trip and how, how life's been since you got back to the States. Um, well, well, first off, it was a no brainer with the time that I had with you guys in, in Egypt and to continue forth. And I'm kind of on this journey to do the seven continents. So it, it lined up perfectly there. And um, yeah, Machu Picchu has always been at the top of the list. So it checked that box. It was in incredible. And, uh, I'm over the altitude, so since I've been back, I just got back to Kauai yesterday, so I spent some time on the mainland, but um, just reeling it in, connecting all the dots, looking back, and what what a trip, looking at some of the, the photos and all these guys post, and it's just, uh, I feel like I'm still on, on the trip. Max, what about you? Why did you want to come on this tour, and um, how's life been since you got back to reality? Yes, I mean, well, I started following you, Derek, I think it was three years ago, something like this. And I personally got into the whole mystery aspect and the megalith and the old stones back, like I would say, 15 years ago, uh, when I first read Graham Hancock's books. Uh, he got me into it, not going to lie. Um, but then what really convinced me to do this tour personally was the Bolivia part, because I've been willing to go to Peru for a while. And when I saw that you were actually also offering those two days in Bolivia, especially like um, the you know, Tiwanaku, Pumapunku and all this, uh, this area over there was really a big interest uh, to me. And so that's mostly what convinced me. Um, and I mean, it's been a blast. I feel like I've been in Peru for one month now. Um, and it was so packed and intense and amazing that I've actually been kind of sick the last three, four days after I came back, just decompressing. Uh, and that's what also I'm spending some time here in France. So I'm feeling much better now. Um, but yeah, the, the tour is incredible. And I feel like I haven't yet, you know, kind of like gotten all the insights and I'm still rethinking about it and discovering new uh, new feelings and uh, yeah memories that I just somehow uh, missed when I was there. So yeah, definitely a blast and I'm glad I'm better now. Well, it was great having you. And Steven, tell us about uh, why you came on the tour and what life's been like since you got back. Yeah, so I megalithic structures and these ancient sites that have, you know, some just these impossible objects scattered all over the world has been a 
mental hobby of mine for a few years and you know following you and and some of the other folks that are bringing light to a lot of these things and and helping to um to rewrite history in a in a small way is uh i just i was tired of of watching the videos and reading and and looking at it from afar i wanted to really just i wanted to put my hands on there get the energy of these spaces and, and have a better understanding of of <clears throat> possibly what our human history is really like and how far it spans and you know your trip caught me right before my 40th birthday so i wanted to kind of enter a new era of my life with this greater understanding of of um what's been going on on this planet and uh and i got back uh late on the 15th and uh honestly it's been kind of a rough uh rough uh re-entry i i think i ate so well and so uh beautifully <laughs> pure with all the fruits and vegetables that, in peru that when i came back and ate pizza and chips and dip and whatever and <laughs> Uh, having a few beers at the airport, I think it just kind of like threw me off. Uh, so I've been dealing with I've been dealing with some stuff. So I'm finally today is kind of my my day to get back. So I'm feeling better today, folks. Yeah, I mean, wasn't there some great food in Peru, you guys? When you think about all the meals we enjoyed together, some of these were multi-course. I mean, the Peruvians. Um, I don't know that there's even or an organic section that that no. you can shop at in the store because it's all organic it's all like from the land and the earth and lush great food yeah the the there's so much pride behind the food too you know you just you kind of scratch at the surface and know that that's where quinoa is from that you learn that they have over four thousand varieties of potatoes <laughs> you know they have i'll let other people talk about some of the other delicacies there but um and and just yeah fruit is everywhere and and the the people seem to love eating well um, and the, the corn is the corn is like megalithic right it not only looks like the walls but it's megalithic in size did you guys any of you guys eat the infamous cooey i don't i haven't i don't think i had that cooey is the uh the peruvian word for a guinea pig you know, I searched it out, but I didn't. I didn't have a chance. It was on my list. Plenty of alpaca. Explain that. That that's the tradition. That's that's how they got to eat. They don't go to Costco. They go yeah, out. there's there's nothing like being handed a. Uh, the first time I went to Peru, I'll never forget a cooey or a guinea pig on a stick. <laughs> and I mean, you're looking at its face and its teeth and its hands, and what a sight! Yeah, the food was great, but it was so great being on this trip with you guys. Uh, I think I captured each one of you in several videos and photos that I've already posted during and since our tour. And Stephen, you and I, I collaborated with you on one where we were at the Cori Concha and you were just showing um, these intricate details on both sides of that one certain block. That thing's got over a million views on Instagram. John was tucked, there, tucked in there at the end talking about how even the, the surface yeah. do. And, and, but I just... I've never seen so many comments come in about people uh, just thinking about how this was done, you know, whether or not it was, you know, molded concrete or it was aliens or whatever, but, but it got people thinking and, and really kind of using their brain to really figure out what's going on because yeah, we were all blown away um, every, every turn we took. Um, but I think it was showcasing a lot of people for the first time that there's some wild, unexplained uh, structural components out there that, that no one really knows. So Yeah, that was a cool video because it had, it had Steven showing this block at Pumapunku. And then, John, you were showing with your you, – you grabbed out your uh, – what was it, your level on your phone app? Yeah. You were, tell us about that. I just it, – it, almost the exact same video we did a couple years ago in egypt and just how it was 100 percent perfectly level and um I, I loved all the comments too so i looked at that on instagram and the variety of things that you know acid mud to aliens it, it just went on and on so i i found that you know that people are, are thinking 
you know, goofing around a little bit, but also putting some thought behind it. And, um, you know, there's a lot of speculation and, and the beauty of it, no one exactly knows. I mean, it's not concrete per se, you know. So. Before we dive deeper into this, I want to just give a shout out to everybody who came on our tour uh, because some of them are probably going to be watching this episode soon. So we had Jeff in Texas. He was awesome. Scott and Willie from Chicago. Man, those cats were cool. <laughs> um, they were like tough guys, but man, they were helping the you know ladies across the street. And man, oh, they were two little softies. Yeah, gentlemen. We, um, we, we had James from Korea. Uh, Christy and Austin from Michigan, an amazing uh, mom and son. We had Mike and Mary from California. We had several Mikes on this tour. Mike was like this macho uh, fire chief captain from L.A. Dude, the stories he told from Skid Row were crazy. Um, we had uh, another Michael from Germany. We had Nilesh uh, from Kenya. This was, by the way, the most international tour I've ever had. It was awesome. We had Caroline from Germany, Matthew from Germany. They were an amazing couple. We had Mike from Virginia Beach, like the ex-Special Forces guy. Uh, loved, loved some of the stories he was sharing. Sean from Australia, and shout out to Sean. Um, he was on my Egypt tour last year, and so kind of like John, he came to Peru. We had Doug uh, Doug and Barbaro from Sweden, Lisa and Lacey from Kansas City, and Fred, we missed you. You should have come with them. We had Ellen from New Mexico, Larry from Australia, and David from Virginia. What an epic group. One of the best groups I've ever had. Just It was so cool. Again, as I always say, we show up as strangers from all over the world. And on that last day when we're having our farewell dinner, people are crying and hugging and it's like we're a family, right? So an amazing group of people. Okay, so now I'm going to I'm gonna unleash this on you guys. Max, I want to hear from you first. You came to Peru. You know, you obviously had some preconceived ideas and theories and thoughts. Um, what would you say was one of your biggest takeaways from this trip? I know that's kind of a big, wide question, so you can take it anywhere you want. What was something that you just came away with going, wow, I probably wouldn't have known this had I not been on this trip? Sure. Um, before I say anything, I wanted to say just to jump on what you just said before. And I think what really made this tour special is also the people. Because yes, we're visiting sites, but the group dynamic was really, really amazing. We're still in contact now. And this also creates those moments in between the sites that kind of like glues everything together. Um, now to answer your question, I mean, as you were saying, I've been doing a lot of research, just like Steven, I wanted to just uh, get to grips with reality and go on the tour. Um, I mentioned before, Bolivia was a big, um, really big, amazing moment for me because Puma Punku specifically was a site that always intrigued me, you know, like so high in the mountains, so isolated. You can only see some videos here and there with these age blocks that all measures one meter tall like for some reason and just being there on site and also uh you know being lucky that we could actually you know roam around kind of freely and 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 really um you know measure stuff and 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 just visit all of this was definitely amazing and i would like to give a special shout out to a specific site that also blew me away and that was PSAC you know, uh, on the road to Machu Picchu. Why? Because I never heard of it, <laughs> despite all of the research. Um, the best way to maybe define this site is, in my opinion, like a smaller Machu Picchu, kind of like, you know, on the mountain, on the hill, following a hike, and you have those three, you know, different uh, generations, architectures that I'm sure we might cover um, very soon. And to me, this is the place that if Machu Picchu is too touristy, just go there because you will have no one, very not credited at all, one of the most amazing hikes to get there. Um, and you see those amazing, you know, water canals that have been pretty much flowing for thousands of years. And to me, that was really the big, big surprise because as I said, completely under the radar um it doesn't get the love that it deserves and uh definitely one of my most amazing sites yeah awesome steven what about you biggest uh takeaway and or favorite site yeah that 
you know, Max kind of kind of uh, touched on on what blew me away the most was that I mean the Peruvians know about all these sites and and a lot of them are very sacred and they've you know they've been visited upon by Peruvians for you know many years centuries um, and a lot of them them touch on them when they when they're praying they're very important to them. Um, but it's it's Machu Picchu that brings all the people. That's where they send up 2,500 people a day, bus people up there. But but like Max said, Pisac is like mini Machu Picchu, and there was really nobody up there except our group. And a lot of these places that we visited, it was just kind of us, you know, just a, maybe a handful of other people. Um, and and I just it. it it's kind of nice to it was it was nice for us because it just it was kind of like we were we were there just in the place with ourselves um especially pumapunku i mean you know it just was us there was no guard there was no buddy there it was just we just almost like stumbled upon the place um and I, let me let me interject real quick that was so shocking pumapunku this ancient, what I believe is a prehistoric location with some of the most insane ancient architecture that I believe proves the theory of lost ancient technology. There was not only no groups there and any other people, there were no guards there. Yeah. Meaning we could get as close as we wanted to these blocks. I just had to say that that was so lucky. And and we and we're a bunch of megalithic nerds. We were very respectful there, you know. It, it we, if they needed any group to jump the rope and get a closer look, it would have been us. And we were very respectful. Right. It was a it's a safe it was a sacred space to me. I felt like I was touching on something that not a lot of people were able to get close and personal with. Um, but but yeah, I felt like we saw stuff that that aren't in any videos it's especially that rock that had those really thin lines with the holes drilled into it um and uh but but it 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 wasn't there might have been incan um settlements around there we know that they were at uh, tiwanaku around the corner but pumapunku is kind of it wasn't really claimed by the incans it just you know, when the Spanish found it, it was kind of the way it was possibly for tens of thousands of years. Who knows? But it's definitely looks like it's been cut with a laser and it looks like it's been made with high mathematical skill and precision. And it's been buried underground until, you know, a hundred years ago. So it's a, it's a wild place. Um, so yeah, that was up on top of the list for sure. Uh, getting through the Bolivian border was well worth it, in my opinion. Um, but the other one for me was uh, Oyente Tambo, which is kind of at the, the the base, you know, Machu Picchu. That's where you get on the train. I had seen pictures of those verticals, you know, megaliths at the top of the mountain before. I kind of thought that that was it. Like, you were going to go up to the top and we're going to see uh, those wild, you know, multi-ton hundred plus ton stones that are just up there but it's the whole complex that place was huge and all that stuff that was down at the bottom of the hill with all the mysterious quarrying and cutouts and the rock those stairs that led to nowhere and that mysterious uh atlantean style fountain that's been going for thousands of years and and it matched the same architectural style as as the one that was in uh, Naupa and Glacia that was just up in a cave. You know, you had to walk there from the railroad tracks. Um, I mean, we just saw places that, that if they were in the United States, they would be, you would have just a $50 entry fee. You would have to, you know, there would be an amusement park around the corner, hotels. And, but some of these places were just like off the road. Um, and it's just it, absolutely fascinating. John, biggest takeaway or favorite site? Um, 
these guys kind of jumped on a couple of them, but that, that sacred cave there, uh, heading up there, getting to the top and, and seeing some of those precision cuts and having the, the reverence there and the, and the respect, you can see it was set up as an altar. There was, there's something very mystical, if you will, something special going on there and, and being able to, I like getting off the beaten track and getting away from the amusement park and the hotels and things like <laughs> what Steven just said there. But, um, that and also climbing the very top that that mountain behind Machu Picchu that was the highlight of my entire trip and uh, I don't think my lungs have completely recovered that's a pretty vertical <laughs> climb and I forgot I even signed up for that and the fact that right at the the moment of truce they're like you're signed up for this where where do you want to go and uh, majority of the group went to the Temple of the Moon there and I'm like am I blowing it should I go that way but I'm so glad that we we climbed to the top there and had that vista view looking down on Machu Picchu and I could just see the 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 dedication that these multiple civilizations the Incas wh whoever did it, it it's it's beyond impressive and, and Lake Titicaca too I mean the enormity there I'm, I'm drawn to water and just that was a really special place there too seeing seeing that and, and a lot of what like a lot of my highlights were just being in the bus driving through the countryside seeing the the aina the land the the culture and and you you've always hired the best from what i can tell um leaders in these groups as far as rumi and ernesto and last year you know a couple years ago muhammad so people that have a, a real reverence for the, the culture the people past and present um it really helps tie tie it all in for me personally so yeah it was it was awesome yeah we had some great guides um handpicked like you said that know the real what i would say the real history the real culture the real legends they're going to get you below the surface right and get you into the meat of what is the strange history here and man you guys all said so many great pieces john you mentioned the hike above machu picchu for those that I just want to explain clear for people that may not understand so you could uh anybody who registered for the tour we had a limited number of spots you could pay extra and get an extra pass to hike the mountain behind Machu Picchu that iconic uh you know mountain peak called Huayna Picchu well when we got there we found out that this extra pass gave you the option to either hike up to the top of that mountain or hike about three quarters of the way up it and then go down behind it where the temple of the moon is this ancient structure behind Machu Picchu, which was my highlight of the whole tour. And I can talk about that later, but John, I want to ask you, what did you see up on the top of Huayna Picchu when it came to the ruins and evidence of structures? What, what were you seeing up there? Well, A, it, it's, it's a vertical, it's a staircase, but it, it's a staircase like this. We were literally climbing hand over fist there to get to the top there. But looking down, it, to me, it, it seemed more of a, a, a vista point. It had some, um, some importance there, too. I don't know exactly what it was for these people, but it, it's a great vantage point to kind of see the whole entire valley and the valley over and the scope of Machu Picchu and tying that in, there's a little cave that you go through up there too. And, um, you know, it's not, not enormous, but they, it's, it's a, it's a strategic spot, I, I believe for, for the people that, that designed it and that there's a reason behind it. And I'm sure it had multiple reasons. Um, you know, they grew a little bit up there. Most of, uh, what was going on was down below, but you know, it, to, to have that, strategic spot up there is kind of what i saw you know kind of to overlook it and for even the the few structures up there that appear to be mostly incan i mean that alone what an incredible feat for the inca to get those stones and build that structure literally up a straight vertical mountain it it's it, I, I had a hard time carrying my water bottle let alone a uh, you know <laughs> 300 pounds stone for the next step. So for the, these, these, these guys were in great shape or something. There was a lot of things going on there. Um, yeah. It, it, and again, the beauty is unparalleled. So that, that, that took me a moment. I just sat in, in solitude and just breathed it in. Max, let me throw it back to you. So coming into the tour, did you know anything about the legend of the Hanan Pacha? 
That's my first question. And then two, we really tried to um, do a good job of explaining this well throughout the tour. And this legend of the Hanan Pacha comes from Jesus Gamara, a gentleman who lives in Cusco and his father, who are some of the premier knowledge keepers of the ancient Andean legends. But one, had you heard of that? And then two, for those who don't know, explain to us what the Hanan Pacha and the three worlds is. Sure. Um, so I did not read any of Jesus Gamara's books, uh, but I did hear about the Hanan Pacha and the different style theory through Graham Hancock, through other authors. So I was not going there completely um, clueless, but it was really well explained by the different guys that we have. And I think this is really important to have people that are not afraid to tell you what they actually think versus what they're supposed to tell you maybe as part of the archaeological um, community. Um, yeah, so pretty much we're looking at three different styles. The first one being the oldest, um, Hanan Pacha, which refers to a first civilization, in my opinion, a first construction style that pretty much carves the bedrock directly. So we're not looking into like uh, at carved stones and blocks of stone, but rather just literally cutting down, cutting the mountain and just uh, carving it the way you actually would like it to uh to um to appear and that's what we see in many sites for example this napa iglesia this cave that we might touch upon again so that's the first style very ancient very precise um very well made overall then you have this intermediary um uran pacha period which is pretty much those gigantic megalithic blocks that you would see maybe saksai waman the korikansha extremely well carved but still individual blocks of stone versus the carved bedrock from before and then the last style which is in my opinion impressive but the least impressive of the three which would be urun pacha which is clearly the um, inca stonework which um, is not that very mysterious in my opinion because it completely aligns with what we know of the inca what they were capable of in terms of tools technology etc um but yes there was really those three different styles that were really the the main uh, in my opinion the main um you know um attractiveness of the tour because this is what when you see the difference and which clearly shows that as you mentioned earlier there is a forgotten past uh in peru uh something that predates the inca and i would just like to add that I mean, obviously, we are all like megalithic nerds. I think we've all done the research here. But literally, no matter how much you know about the, the stone there, no matter how many videos or books you read, being there on site really blows you away because you can never expect it to be so big and so precise. Um, and, you know, Saksai Waman, for example, those gigantic walls, which is second generation mostly, so Uran Pacha, you may know that the stone, the biggest stones is somewhere between like 350 to 400 tons. But when you have it in front of you, this is really when you're confronted to like the greatness of what the people achieved. Um, and, you know, we were having altitude sickness, uh, just walking around and carrying the bottle. Um, and you had those people just moving, lifting, transporting all of those um, amazing stones. And so I really enjoyed those, especially the places when you can see the three different generation and styles at the same place, which is really obvious to me. Well stated. Uh, Stephen and John, did you guys, what, what was your thoughts on the theory of the Hanan Pacha or the three worlds and or the three different builders, you know, and I should say each one was represented by the Hanan Pacha is represented by the condor, which you see embedded everywhere in Andean mythology. Uran Pacha is represented by the Puma, and then Ukan Pacha, the third one, Max, Ukenpacha. yeah, yes, represented by the serpent, which you see embedded everywhere. Stephen, John, what were your thoughts on those theories and how you related them to the sites you saw? The stuff that I mean, the the place I mentioned uh, that was that John and I talked about that was up in the cave uh, that blew our minds. I mean, that it looked like the oldest thing touched by humans on the planet. I mean, it looked like something, and maybe Derek can add this, you know, post-production, but but it looked like something out of a science fiction movie. You know, it looked like a prop out of science fiction. It, these sharp lines and these, it's almost like a art deco design, but it... it um, You're talking about Napa Iglesia, Napa, right? 
Yeah, yeah, in the in the fountain at, at Oyente Tambo, um, kind of the similar style, yeah. but just the stuff that's like carved out right out of the bedrock. Some of the some of that stuff at at Sacsayhuaman in the same way where you have just I mean it's staircases going to nowhere or it's or it's just these it may look like a throne or maybe they just you know were playing around and cut a rock out and it and it left this like perfectly rectangular impression in the bedrock or in this boulder that that you know has been sitting there for a million years um but it's just that's where the the biggest mysteries are is is the stuff that's like cut right into the side of the wall the the all the portals that we saw hmm. where it's just these perfectly cut rectangles or trapezoids that just you know lead into the rock but maybe at some point when it was made it led to someplace else who knows um but but the the next step you know the the next step from har and punch is is nothing short of spectacular that's still completely unexplainable um, the building styles that we saw without mortar, the the rocks of Sacsayhuaman and some of those spots in downtown Cusco look like they've been grown and sh and formed into the shape of the rocks around it. They look like they're kernels of corn, like we mentioned. Um, and and who knows? I mean, we don't know. It's quite possibly that's how exactly how they did it because it, but it looks like that's the way, but it just the countless walls of stone that have been left over that that have no real uh, explanation using tech today's technology um i mean we can debate it on the comment section all we want but un unless it starts getting replicated you know we're it's still up for speculation but it's it's old as hell it's old as hell and, and you know um and, and then bump it up yeah you just the ink and work like it's very obvious that the Incan came across these half uh, these half buildings, especially in Machu Picchu. They they go up about four feet, and then you see the rest of it uh, built up with with raw stones and mud mortar, um, and they complete the buildings. If they had built, you know, if they had built with megalithic stones without mortar, they would have built the whole the whole building, you know, the whole structure. So. Um, there's obviously, you know, those all those different styles are there, um, and they all hold their own different kind of cosmological uh, attachment with the Peruvians. Like they have this whole um, this whole world, this whole the, all these realms, um, uh, and have all significant purposes um, in their spiritual practice. And it's all it's so beautiful. Yeah, Stephen, you hit on. One of the pr premier points I've made before, you mentioned the comment section, you know, I, I'm i always posting videos and photos, right, of these megalithic sites. And so often you get comments, basically, if, if you basically state that this was advanced technology, somehow you're slamming the Incans. And not at all. I think the Incans were an amazing civilization who did incredible feats in their day with, with the technology they had. But as you pointed out, Stephen, if you go to Machu Picchu or many of these sites, you see at least two distinct forms of engineering. You see the mortarless megalithic on the base, about four feet up, and then it ends. And then the rest is small rough stone and mortar on top of it, finishing the building. The big question is, you, you made the point, if the Inca made all of this, as the mainstream says, then why didn't they make it all out of the superior method that's almost indestructible why mm -hmm. would you make half of it indestructible and the top half very destructible with loose with with small rocks and mortar so great point and then the other thing I, that made me think was you guys mentioned like napa iglesia this amazing megalithic cave half the time when i'm posting content you know there's always the geo palmer crowd that says everything was geopolymer, you know, basically ancient bags of cement. It's funny how they're uh, radio silent when it comes to a site like Napa Iglesia, right? This cave you enter that's got precision 4D portal looking trapezoidal cuts. 
right? It's funny how they're so silent because um, clearly that has nothing to do with geopolymer. That has to do with cutting and removing, right? John, you're next up, bud. What do you think? Yeah, just to piggyback on what they were saying there, and it was all kind of a new concept. Max said it really eloquently. I, I didn't have all three of the names down. I, I had the the condor puma serpent idea down pat there, but the the I, I'm logical, and the, the evidence is right there in front of you. I mean, we've, we've touched on that. There is, without a doubt, and I didn't even know about this until I got there, there are three distinct types of construction, and that's evident. And like you just touched upon, the, the Incas, the, the rough stones built on the perfect, you know, 300-ton, to you know, 20-ton blocks, whatever size. They're, they're all different sizes and cut to precision there. Um, and again, not taking from the Incas. I mean, magnificent, you know. Um, you know, here where I live, the Tongans build walls. And they're some of the best wall builders in, in the world. And it reminded me of the Inca style there. And you'll see a lot of that with those plateaus for the farming thing. So that was real evident on, on them doing that. But the megalithic stuff, you know, there, there's so many concepts on how it was, it was done. I love reading the comments there. And I, I kind of stepped back and, and just was in awe of it and not so much. I'm not going to crack the code. You, you three might, but <laughs> I, I don't think I'm going to. So just seeing that was was evidence um, to me that the, there were several different, um, I don't technology, uh, artistry, you know, capability, whatever you want to call it. That that, that was crystal clear and, and very evident to me to, to see that. And they're all magnificent. One of the first sites we saw when we when we flew south to Puno in southern Peru by the Bolivian border was Siastani. And this is where these strange enigmatic towers lined, you know, the hills above the lake. Um, real quick, what what's your guys' possible theories on what those were? Do you believe, as the mainstream would say, these were just some kind of burial chambers? Or do you think it was something far different? I mean, personally, I'm not opposed to the idea that they could have been burial chambers for the Inca, um, you know, but I'm questioning whether or not they were the one actually, you know, the original builders, or if they just, you know, built like upon what was already existing. Because, for example, we didn't really touch on it too much during the tour, but one thing that I found quite puzzling is that the outer layer of some of the chulpas were actually megalithic meaning more or less you know large stones etc but the inside i remember this one particular chulpa was made of like really smaller stone different kinds of stones too uh, usually softer and all of them stuck together with mortar which will align in my humble opinion with what the inca did so Maybe they were burial chambers. If we found some skeletons, probably. But are they really the first builders? Or could have this been used for like another purpose? And I think this is a question we can actually apply to a lot of different sites. Um, but so I would say, yeah, I'm really convinced that the Inca used it this way. But yeah, there could be some other unknown origin. And I must, I must say, I have no idea what was the original purpose. The the chapas up there on those hills, that was like the the coolest like introduction to like the trip. Uh, I know a lot of people had like three days before that with the Nazca lines and stuff, but um, just kind of coming up on those and the golden hour and and uh, but but just to describe what they were, I mean the ones that impressed me were the, I mean there was only one complete one, right? And it was it had megalithic curved cut stone that had a kind of a top to it, kind of a, a dome top, um, and then a tiny little entrance at the bottom. And I mean, we can call these things burial chambers, religious things, tombs, all we want, but that's just kind of like how we like to describe ancient things. Um, I, I mean, I, I'm only assuming that most of the stuff that we saw, including these these towers, these chalpas, had a function. They had to have had some sort of function, um, just like the obelisks all over the world, um, you know, the pyramids. Um, there's theories on all this stuff that that 
they had function that they wouldn't have put so much effort into these if they didn't have some sort of reason that you know benefited society uh, in the long term and not just buried a dude uh, for his own purpose um, but it was very mysterious to see that the the, the smaller stones uh, with the mud mortar that that are assumed to be ink and work it looked like they filled some of them in it looked like they've some of the ones that were kind of half destroyed a looked like they've been exploded at some point the the rocks go the megalithic rocks are going the other way looks like it had been exploded and one side of it just kind of you know erupted and scattered the stones everywhere but but then it looked like the incans kind of filled them all in i don't know if if that was i don't know what the purpose was for that but uh yeah with the lake in the background that place was beautiful and I, and i don't i don't need to know the answer i just thought it, you know it's just a cool introduction to the whole tour i think a lot of what we saw besides just there too had been um repurposed multi-purposed you know over hundreds of years taking on um different forms and and, and um you know purposes um it, it almost has like a energy channel to it initially or you know kind of had some of that egyptian touch to it but you know that's all speculation to why they originally built that but there's definitely the the rounded masonry and the stones like that and then having the to be filled in there if somebody came up behind and i think over time it, it took on different meanings and, and maybe they stopped they they weren't activated anymore and then they became tombs i mean there's a lot of ideas that were swirling through my head about that and um throughout this and one 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 thing i would like to add too and this is what um steven touched upon and it's a constant in all of those sites and not only in peru and bolivia but also everywhere on earth is this complete devastation like destructions everywhere everything looks exploded you know flipped over and to me this really adds up to the idea that it's actually way more ancient because you would have to dig in the past to find some kind of cataclysm that could explain what you see because when you see those amazing architecture that are really built to be earthquake resistant you would wonder what actually creates this destruction that we see everywhere or why a lot of those sites are actually like not finished incomplete you know so i think this really adds up to the mystery like when we were at uh Saximaman, and again we tweaked this tour to give you guys more time at big sites like that instead of jumping around to three sites a day and you only have an hour and a half at Saximaman, we got like three or four hours how awesome was that to just explore and have your own free time but that Chincana uh, stone we saw on the backside of Saksimoman, and Steven, I got that epic video of you walking what looked like stairs sideways. Um, like you look at that stone, for example, and you see these all over Cusco. You see these massive boulders or rock outcroppings with, again, the laser-like precision Hanan Pacha uh, shaping. But you look inside it and you see weathering in massive pockmarks from like Ice Age landslides coming through, right? Um, giving you a sense of how ancient these are. Um, because some estimates state that the last time there was, you know, basically ice sheets flowing through was 10,000 BC. And you can see it's on top of what was made. Because you'll see like a what looks like a megalithic throne cut out, and then you just see all of the uh, pock marks from these ice sheets coming through, right? So there was so much to see, so much to talk about. What was your guys' take on the uh, Amaru Muru Portal Stargate? I wanted to ask you real quick um, because that was just wasn't that a surreal place? Um, obviously, there's a now a modern day highway going through, but you can just picture in the ancient days. This thing is right looking at Lake Titicaca, and here, carved out of the face of this huge rock, is what looks like a literal stargate to walk through into another dimension. What were your thoughts on that site and the music that our guide played 
that was kind of cool. Yeah, I feel like, um, at least to our guide, Ernesto, that that was one of the most important sites to him, you know, because he he pulled his cousin out and they, they played music. Um, and the music, you know, it was for us, but, but the music was for, for him. It was for uh, his spiritual connection to the space. Um, and he wanted to kind of share his, his understanding of the area, telling the story of the sun disc, uh, going through the portal. But it, it was when the vastness of the beauty of Peru kind of settled in alongside some of these sites, at least for me, where where I'm I'm in an actually stunning country. This place is beautiful. You see the portal, and then you just keep hiking up the mountain, and then it's just it it looks like um, these you know these rock formations that I'd never seen in my life. Um, you know, kind of jutting out of the side of the mountain, looking like you know Stegosaurus scales. You know. Um, and, and it just was, it was, a, and Derek and I kind of explored and we found that, that opening in the rock where it, it you had that vista, um, and, and then Ernesto was showing us all of these ancient formations that there was the caterpillar and the sleeping horse and, and all of these structures that people have been identifying for thousands of years. They've been coming out there, having picnics, having, you know, spiritual moments, uh, having their kids go through the portal. And it's just been a place, uh, I mean, people were having picnic there and, and hanging out. Um, but it just was kind of a nice place to be, but such history um, and such beauty. And the legend, right? I mean, this this sun disk, as you pointed out, like this guy who literally, this Inca guy, apparently, who like put a sun disk in the middle of the door and then somehow crossed so, where we don't know um but it's definitely like hard not to you know entertain the idea that this could be some kind of gate involved with some lost technology i mean i'm personally not the one that is the most really into this but i must say even for me who's trying to be as like down to earth as possible this legend really had me thinking yeah. um, because it's really crazy yeah and max is referring to a legend i shared when we were at the site of uh, one of the legendary uh, Incan uh, priests. When the Spanish were arriving to sack Cusco and take over the Cori Concha, which was the Inca's capital building, um, he took their golden sun disc, which was hidden inside the Cori Concha, and according to the legend, traveled out into the wilderness to a stargate where he placed the golden disc inside. And then like Max said, he uh, disappeared. And so it might sound like a pretty fanciful legend um, until you realize this priest's name was Amaru Muru. And this site we're talking about is Amaru Muru and it's out in the wilderness. And if you could create a stargate, an ancient stargate, it would look exactly like this. So, uh, John, what were your thoughts on this site? And then I'll get your guys' closing thoughts and we'll call it a wrap. Yeah, it was definitely uh, had some cultural significance, you know, past and present. I, I hiked to the very back of that thing and trying to find, a, I don't know what I was trying to find, but it looked like almost burn marks way on the back of that mountain. I, I started on the backside. You guys all went to the front and I don't know why I got sidetracked there, but uh, beautiful spot. It had it almost had a um, a Utah Zion kind of vibe to it, you know, the and a lot of the rocks. So beyond that, obviously beauty. And and for Ernesto to get out the bowls and and, and really tie it all in there, um, kind of transported me back 500 years ago. I could see, you know, that's that's a big part of this trip. As I like role play like time bandits or something, going back in time. What was it like? And what were they? going through their head there and that legend ties it all in perfectly you know it, it, that is the perfect portal <laughs> yeah, yeah when when er, when ernesto busted out his musical instruments again the power of music at a picturesque ancient site is good enough but man there was something about him uh playing those crystal bowls frequency um, 
the frequency, man, I was, I'm not the world's biggest feeler, but I was feeling something there. Guys, we're about out of time. I'd love to get each of your closing thoughts on the trip, takeaways, whatever, in a, a minute or two. Max, we'll start with you and then we'll go Steve and John. What are your closing thoughts on this trip and everything you experienced or maybe something else you came away with? Uh, it could even be something about the culture, uh, whatever you want. Max, go for it. Sure. I mean, well, obviously, Peru is amazing. Um, I would do it all over again. Uh, no no questions asked. I think for me, what I mean, as I said before, um, just one sentence, regardless of what your mindset is, regardless how much you research about it, being there on site and touching the stone and seeing the stone with your own eyes really is um you know something to do um and i would definitely recommend the tour too because what i think is really cool with those tours apart from obviously the people and the and the group dynamics etc it's how everything is also optimized right it really is the the trip of a like the experience of a lifetime because you're just we have some time to rest don't worry about that uh, we have amazing hotel to rest in the evening but it's quite packed quite intense and it's really difficult to see so many important sites alternating between megalithic sites but also like really places dear to the peruvian people um and you know maybe yeah on a closing thought on top of just nurturing all my megalith um, megalithomania kind of uh, to me was also those specific moments that really add to the trip you know i see i see us at this yaku restaurant in cusco for example in this huge uh terrace outdoor area um i see us in the train ride to machu picchu um you know those are the cool places in between pretty much that really make the, the the whole trip special and i don't think you can really achieve that much in such a little time without actually going through the group tour um, and again i would like to do a special shout out to you derek for organizing it and also to like to collaborate with such amazing guides because on top of rumi ernesto and the others more than just the explanation they're giving you it's also the wisdom that is attached to it you know the beliefs of the of the peruvian tradition but also you know living simply and, and being kind to people and believe and don't forget about the cosmology the stars and i think it's really amazing for us human beings to also get out of the routine get out of the one to uh, nine to five jobs and really explore the words and meet those different kind of people which could be equally as amazing as the the stones that we're seeing so i definitely recommend it <laughs> Thanks, Max. And I got to give you a shout out um, for making my daughter's highlight of her trip. I brought my eight-year-old daughter on this tour uh, with my wife. And so my daughter's highlight, she's eight years old, is the train ride to Machu Picchu. But not just because it's this amazing Vista Dome train, you know, and just so you know, some groups are just in a normal train. We had the Vista Dome where you can see outside the roof and the mountains which makes all the difference. But um, as Ryan and I sat next to Max and Barbara, if you're listening, you are awesome. And as I brought her Uno cards. And so we were playing Uno and that was all cool until Max taught us the French version of playing Uno. And so as I thought it was so cool to learn your French rules for Uno and then as you learned, the uh, yeah. student became the teacher as Azariah won four in a row. So thanks for <laughs> making her trip and teaching us your French Uno rules. Stephen, what about you, man? Final takeaway. I, I like what Max said about all the in-between. I, I thought uh, the tour didn't cut any corners. We ate well. Uh, we stayed in these beautiful hotels. Uh, the commutes were were nice. I mean, it's just I don't mind sitting in a bus for a few hours if there's good company and and the air conditioners on and and uh and and the train ride was was stunning but but it it this trip was different than other trips for me where um you know i i, I either visit a friend or i go with with uh a, a, you know a companion or a, or a friend to go on a trip to a specific place and you know it's usually like a city or a or a you know a, maybe a country that that you just kind of hit the cities and you do city tours and you see the museums. And there was plenty of that, you know, when we were in Cusco, et cetera. But, 
but this this was different the the sites that we're seeing the the mysteries around some of these places where you're really in a contemplative state uh when you go to each of these places and and for me personally i took it uh at a spiritual direction and i and i really wanted to make sure that i was kind of connecting with i don't the, whatever energy is is held in these stones whatever that mystery is i mean it just to have this, these architectural masterpieces just still intact on this planet, uh, that there's an unknown purpose, unknown age, unknown people put these together, uh, you know, and the, the technology use is we don't have any idea. And for me to just kind of like put my hands on it and to just kind of wonder and to kind of like understand that that the, maybe the timeline of human history isn't what we were taught in schools and isn't what uh, we perceive. Um, and just to kind of embrace that, that there's a possibility that, that when I touch a, a wall, the walls of Saxe Walman, that it could have been built by somebody 30,000 years ago or more. I mean, that's what our guides uh, kind of uh, put out there that, that even Peruvians, they don't have any idea um, and, but the, the ancient part that it, and I, and I've, I've, after this trip, I've dedicated any, I mean, I love the beach. I love going to the beach and just kind of lounging, right? Like going to whatever Puerto Vallarta or something and, and enjoying a Mai Tai on the beach. That's fantastic vacation. But, um, but I really like, if I go to some place, I want to make sure there's an element of ancient impossible objects you know whether it's japan whether it's cambodia whether i i make my way out to egypt obviously but but i just want to make sure that like you know getting out of tokyo i want to make sure that i see the those sites out there that are unexplainable um because i'm i i i don't know there it's something that i need to see on this planet it's just part of um part of our human history and i feel like it's up to me. It's up to me, folks. Uh, <laughs> I need to see for myself. Well said, John. Awesome. Yeah. And, and kind of along those lines there, this is, this was more than a vacation. It was a definite adventure. And um, if I would have tried to have done this on my own, you know, Derek, you, you put this together so well between, you know, Peru and Egypt, just having the access that I would not have been able to have through uh, your team leaders and guides and yourself. So, having full access to these things, bilingual safety, just getting into Bolivia. I mean, they had to go to bat. There was some bureaucracy there. I would I would have given up. I would not have gone to Bolivia if it wasn't for this tour. So to piece all that together there. And then um, it's also the, the, the combination of taking, you know, the legend, the wisdom and the academia and mixing it all together there. And, and of course, that there are some down moments to it too. I mean, you could go get a massage, you could go down to the, the lounge, you can do whatever you want, but we got in there and we and we uh, got cerebral on a few things and spiritual. I, I felt a spiritual element there as well. And for me, after you know nine days with the tour and then ending up in Cusco the, the final day and on my own, waiting for the ride to the airport there, going up to the Inca Museum and looking at the real textbook academia, this is how it was all done. And then tying that together with what I just experienced, not what I heard or read, but experienced and, 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 and not conflicting the two, but they really, um, they paralleled each other really well. It wasn't what I read in you, you know, world history in, in sixth grade, you know, it, we, we got deep on a few things and I'm forever grateful for that, Derek. And you're, you have a lovely family. I'm just really stoked to see them again, too. Well, guys, thank you so much for uh, coming on the tour. Thank you so much for your time to do this uh, interview. If you're watching by video, Stephen has his cat. Uh, that What a fat-looking cat. That's awesome with green eyes. <laughs> guys, thank you for your um, your feedback and just sharing your experiences. This was a lot of fun to do this recap. And um Again, to everybody else on the tour who hears this or watches this, you guys were amazing. Thank you for coming on the tour. And we're going to try to do a Zoom um, hangout maybe in a couple of weeks with everybody who can make it. But again, guys, um, thank you so much for your feedback, for coming on the tour. 
Um, it was so awesome getting getting to know each of you. And um, what I love most about these tours is all the friends I make uh, all over the world. So now I've got I've got John there in Hawaii, who's already offered the place when I need to come uh, get away and surf. I got my bro Stephen in Oklahoma, the handyman. Um, and then I've got Max over in Germany to um, when I need a European fix, I can go hang out with him. So, guys, thank you so much. This was fun. And um, to everybody listening or watching, thank you for your support. Uh, I would recommend everybody go to stargatevoyager.com slash tours. Bookmark that because as soon as my next tours are solidified, they'll be right there. And our last two tours sold out, so you want to, you know, try to get a, a jump on some of these tours. And just for everybody listening right now, this is kind of breaking news. Our next tour looks like it's going to be at the end of May 2025. It's going to be a combo tour. I've never done anything like this, meaning it's going to be a Peru, Bolivia, and Easter Island tour where you can do them all together and it's like a 15 day tour, or you can just do one section and each section is at least five days. So um, if you've never been to Peru, this is your chance. If you've been to Peru, but you haven't been to Bolivia or Easter Island and you want to do one or two of those, you can do that. So stargatevoyager.com slash tours, uh, that will be released soon. Guys, thank you so much and let's stay in touch. All right. Thank you, Derek. And good to see you guys. See you soon. Bye-bye.